country. I don't want to really mention the name, but he's a nice guy. I know every one of them. They're very smart people. They're very sharp. They're at the top of their game. Our guy was not at the top, and this one is just — she never could be. By the way, lousy student, failed her law exams. Did you know that? She couldn't pass her, law, her bar — she couldn't pass her bar exams! Okay? Does anyone know that? They're not going to do — they say that on NBC News. Ladies and gentlemen, we have breaking news. Kamala Harris could not pass her bar exams. But she's going to be a great president, right? No, she couldn't pass the bar exam. She couldn't pass anything. Couldn't pass everything. She couldn't pass anything. But just think of this. These countries — and if I were the head of one of the countries, I would be worse than any of them. I mean, some of them actually have half of their prison population still. I wouldn't have any. Richard wouldn't have any. You and I would — we — our country would be the safest country. Every criminal would be in the United States of America. I can tell Richard Childress. Every criminal would already be here. Every jail would be empty. Every mental institution in St. Asylum would be empty. They'd all be in the United States. And that's what — in a short period of time, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have all of their criminals. The only thing good about them is they make our criminals look like very nice people by comparison. These are serious criminals. These are rough — these are rough killers. But under Border Czar Harris, can you believe it? Our communities are being ravaged by migrant crime. I call it migrant crime. I used to call it Biden migrant crime. But now I'll probably change it to Harris or Kamala. You know, it took him about what, four years to pronounce her name right, and then she did an overthrow. <laughs> that was a very undemocratic move, wasn't it? Earlier this year, a 15-year-old girl in Massachusetts was raped by a migrant who Biden and Harris flew into the United States against all orders. In upstate New York two months ago, another 15-year-old girl was attacked by an illegal alien that just walked into our country, assaulted with a metal pipe, abducted, driven to an isolated area, raped and killed. And in Texas last month, 12-year-old Jocelyn Nungari was tied up, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death by two illegal aliens who Biden and Harris released into the United States and refused to get them out. What kind of a vice president or what kind of a border czar allows these monsters to come into our country? And this is just a small portion. These people are here now by the hundreds of thousands. And remember this, it's like anything else. They're just getting comfortable. They've just gotten here a little while ago. So you haven't seen the kind of crime that's going to be inflicted on our country. They're just getting comfortable. They're getting used to being here. They don't know about the words politically correct yet when you catch them and you do nothing, and then you catch them again and do nothing. They don't know. The only time they do something, if it happens to be Trump, because he talks about how the rigged election was a disgrace. Oh, he should get the electric chair because he said the election was rigged. But if you rape and kill somebody and strangle them and dump them in a creek, that's okay with these people because they're crazy. And we don't want these people running our country anymore. What kind of person allows innocent American girls to be raped and murdered while keeping our border wide open? Never change it. Never change it. You know, they passed for the election about two weeks ago. They passed something that's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. But you know that, Brandon. They said they passed some nonsense so that they could have a new — we're having a news conference. It actually made it worse. It actually — look at me saying it did. It made it worse. It's horrible. Kamala's deadly destruction of America's borders is completely and totally disqualifying. She shouldn't even be allowed to run for president, what she's done. She's committing crimes. No person who deliberately lets these kind of savage criminals into America should ever be trusted with power again, should ever be trusted to be the president of our country. If Border Czar Harris stays in charge, every week we'll bring a never-ending stream of illegal alien rapists, bloodthirsty killers, and child predators to go after our sons and our daughters. That's what's going to happen. Everybody knows that. You're not going to talk these people into being wonderful citizens. If I'm elected, we will immediately deputize local police who are dying to do the job, by the way, but they're 
power has been taken away. And we'll form a massive dragnet to scour the nation for the monsters who are murdering and raping children all over the world. Many of them have come here because they're looking for them in their own countries for rape, for murder, for all sorts of things. And we will ship them back to the country from which they came. We're going to get them out of here. You know, when I first came here, I don't tell this much, but you couldn't get them back. I said, well, we're going to get them out. MS-13 in particular, the most savage, vicious gang. They killed two 16-year-old girls walking to school. They killed them with a knife. They sliced up their body. They didn't want to use a gun because that's too quick. They didn't want to use a gun. They sliced them up. They sliced them up into pieces. They killed them. And uh, Nancy Pelosi said they should stay in trial. You know, nice fair trial. No, these are monsters. But when I first came here, I said, we're going to get these people out, MS-13. And the general came up to Sir, uh, President Obama at the time. President Obama has been trying for four years. President Bush has been trying. They've all been trying. The countries won't accept them. They don't want their MS-13 back. I said, really? You can't get it back? No, sir. What they do is they put major big aircraft, commercial aircraft, on their runways so that when we're getting nearby, we can't land, sir. And then they clog up the roads, right, Brandon? They clog up. He knows because he was trying to send them back. They couldn't send them back. Then they clog up the roads so the buses and cars, every way you can't get back into their countries. And they tell the people, we'll give you the death penalty if you come back in. Other than that, they're quite friendly, actually. So I said, really, they won't accept them. Yes, sir, we have to live with them. I said, we're not going to live with them. I asked, how much money do you like? Honduras and Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico. How much money do they get from us for economic development and aid? Sure, we pay them $750 million a year. Now, that's peanuts compared to all that, but still a lot of money. We pay them $750 million a year, sir. I said, tell them that we're not paying any more. They're in default. We're not giving them the money. We're not giving them any more money, Brandon. We're not giving. You were there, right? You were there. So we notified them, you're not getting any more money. The three countries in particular, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, rough countries. And they were sending all of their criminals into our country. They said, we're sending them back. And you're not going to put any airplanes on the runway. And you're not going to clog up the roads. We're sending them back. But I said, how much money? 750. Inform them that they're not getting any more money. There's no more aid. We call it aid because we're stupid. We call it aid. You're not getting any more aid. There will be no more aid to your country. And the next morning, I got a call separately from all three presidents of these countries. They're very streetwise guy. They're very streetwise people. And they called me. And they said, sir, there must be a misunderstanding. I said, what's, what's up? He goes, sir. You have stopped sending our aid to us. I said, that's right, because you're not letting the criminals that you sent in caravans and otherwise you sent into our country, you're not letting them go back to your country because we said, well, sir, uh, I'd like to talk about that. We would be delighted to take MS-13 back into our country. And all three countries are same exact. And we sent them back, Tom Homan and all our guys, right? And that guy right there. We sent them back at record levels like nobody's ever seen. Stand up, Brandon. Brandon Judd. Right, Brandon? We sent them back. Brandon was shocked because he, you know, he was the head of the Border Patrol. And I'll tell you a little secret. He's not supposed to endorse anybody. He's really not. But he got so fed up with the incompetent people that when I ran, he said, I don't care. I'm endorsing Trump. I said, you're not supposed to do it. I said, I don't. And he never, he never wavered, did he? He never wavered. Him and his whole group of people, they're incredible. These are incredible people. You know, it's much easier for him not to do the job. But they don't want that. They want to straighten out our country. They love the country as much as anybody in this room. They want to work. It's risky. It's dangerous. They don't want to not do their job. They want to make our borders strong and our country safe. And we're going to be doing that in six months. We're going to be doing that. You know, unfortunately, we have to wait till January 20th. But I can tell you that November 5th, 
will be the most important day in the history of our country. We're going to take our country back from these lunatics. During her entire time as border czar, Kamala has not had a single conversation with the chief of Border Patrol or the unions or anybody. Did they ever call you? Did they ever call Brendan Judd, please? Get him on the phone. Brendan, how are we doing on the border? I, now, I used to call. He goes, horrible. <laughs> how are we doing on the border, Brendan? We're doing, he just goes, horrible. But I'd call you all the time, right? I'd say, how the hell are we doing, Brandon? Now, we were doing great. That's why the chart, right? But we were doing great. But they uh, talked to the four top people on the border. Have you ever spoken to Biden? Biden doesn't know he's alive. You know, the head of the FBI was, you know that, right? He was in front of Congress today, and one of the great congressmen asked him a question. Have you ever noticed in all your meetings with Biden that he's cognitively a degenerate? And he said, no, I never noticed that. I never noticed that. No, no, really, there was nothing to talk about. I never noticed that. Now, anybody that says that, you know they're not telling the truth. It's a very serious thing. It's a very serious thing. No, I didn't notice. I didn't notice. No, I didn't notice. I didn't notice he couldn't stand up. I didn't notice he can't walk. And I didn't notice he can't think and he couldn't talk. Other than that, he's doing quite well, however. Thank you. No, he didn't notice. That's a very bad thing. Boy, a very bad thing. A very sick thing. We're pleased to be joined today by former president of the National Border Patrol, and that's the man I've just been talking about. He's been so incredible. The patrol council, the head guy and the boss, Brandon Judd. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. And Brandon, can you come up and say a couple of words? We have time. Do we have time? Come on, Brandon Judd. Come on, Brandon. And I'll bet you he can beat me up those, I'll bet you he can beat me up those stairs. Remember when um, Biden challenged him to a golf match and yet Trump was just playing with Bryson DeChambeau? Yeah. You, you beat him, didn't you? <laughs> Look, I lived this. I lived this. Under five presidents, I worked under five presidents. Never have we seen a more secure border. You know this. This isn't a secret. The most secure border we've ever had was under Donald Trump. The less... We had fewer drug overdoses under Donald Trump. We had fewer criminal aliens under Donald Trump. Like he said in 2019, zero known terrorists. That number has jumped up more than 100% under Joe Biden. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're seeing right now. This was amazing. It was all about policy. October 7th, 2016, the day of Access Hollywood. Come on, Locker Talk, seriously? And they thought that that was going to bring him down. We did a press conference with Donald Trump, October 7th, 2016, because it was about policy. That's what it's about. If we have proper policy, we can secure the border and we can keep your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren safe. He can do that. He can do it. They refuse. Kamala Harris knows what she needs to do. I was there. I gave her all of the policies that she needed, all of them, and she refused to implement them. She does not care about you. She does not care about the safety of this country. He does. This is the man for the presidency. Thank you. Wow. That was great. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you very much. He does some job. He does some job. Now that She's running for president. Kamala is suddenly trying to transform her personality to pretend she is tough on crime. She's so bad on crime. In fact, Kamala Harris was the original Marxist district attorney. She was the first of them. You know, you hear all about them in Philadelphia and Los Angeles. She was the first. She was worse than any of them. 
She supports ending cash bail nationwide. She wants no bail. If you murder somebody, just go home and relax. Murder a couple of other people. Which means releasing violent criminals immediately after arrest. She supports stripping police officers of legal protections, ending jail sentences for parole violators. And in 2020, she helped raise $35 million to bail out criminals released from jail after they shot at our police, looted stores, sexually assaulted innocent victims, and committed many other very serious crimes. She was giving them money and bailing them out. One of the dangerous criminals Kamala helped bail out of jail was Sean Michael Tillman. You know that name, a repeat offender who, with Harris's help, was set free. He then went on to murder a man on a train platform in St. Paul, Minnesota, shooting him in cold blood six times, lying on the ground. Shot him in the head and in the torso six times. Kamala Harris wants to be the president for savage criminals, illegal aliens. I will be the president for law-abiding Americans of every race, religion, color, and creed. And I will stop the Democrats' party war. Remember this, the Democrats, they have a war going with police. They have a war. They don't want to talk about it, but they want it. The Democrat Party has a war on with police. We will stand up to the Marxist district attorneys, defund the police. That's what they want, defund. They want to defund. She wants to defund the police. Now, she's pulled back on it, but that's where she is going. I don't even — does anybody even understand the concept? That's like open borders. That's like men and women's sports. The same thing. I think it's maybe even crazier than any of them. We will give our police back their power, protection, respect that they deserve. We're going to give them back the respect that they deserve. Today, I am honored to receive the official endorsement of the National Association of Police Organizations, which is the largest in our country. It represents 250,000 police officers nationwide. It's such an honor to get it. To me, that's a great honor. To me, that's something that means the largest anywhere in the United States. It's the greatest people. I'd like to ask their president, Mick McHale, to come up and say a few words, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Ladies and gentlemen, I am truly honored to stand before you today and on behalf of the National Association of Police Organizations, I am pleased to formally announce NAPO's endorsement of Donald J. Trump for President of the United States. If I may, as President, President Trump directed the Attorney General to aggressively prosecute those who attack officers for simply being in a uniform. <laughs> President Trump, he signed the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Act. And ladies and gentlemen, that's protecting the protectors. <laughs> President Trump also signed the ability for surplus military equipment to once again be used to protect you, the citizens, not to take your rights. And one of the most important things that the President did, he recognized, he recognized that the men and women who provide public safety, who are part of law enforcement, deserve the same constitutional rights as the people we serve.
Mr. President, once again, we are proud and pleased to support your campaign, and we are here for anything, anything that you ever may need. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. That's, so, that's a big one. That's something that means a lot to all of us in this room. It's no wonder the Democrat Party and their thugs are so desperate to stop us. They know that we are the only ones who can stop them. We're the only ones. This is it. This is the big election coming up. This is it. This is going to be the biggest of them all. All of their persecution is only happening because I'm running for president. They're leading big in the polls, every one of them. And we're not just leading against Kamala. We're also leading against everyone, including big leads right here in the great state of North Carolina. We have a big lead. We have a big, beautiful lead. The radical left Democrats rigged the presidential election in 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election in 2024. You. Right, Michael? Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it truly a great badge of honor. I never thought I'd be saying that, but I consider it a badge of honor because I'm being indicted for you. And never forget our enemies want to take away my freedom because I will never, ever let them take away your freedom. I'll never let it happen. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. I just happen to be standing in their way, and I always will. Thank you. Thank you. We're pleased to be joined tonight by many great North Carolina patriots, including Congressman Richard Hudson. Where is Richard? Richard Hudson. Richard. He's a big Wonderful, wonderful guy, wonderful warrior, Richard. Thank you. A man who I've just been involved in from the day he first went in, I endorsed him. Everyone said, who is he? Turned out to be an incredible congressman, but now he's running for attorney general, and he's going to be your next attorney general, Dan Bishop. Where's Dan? Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Get out and vote for him. He's incredible. Great job. And you were a great guy. Richard, we're going to miss him in Congress, but that's okay. Great, great luck, Dan. Congressional candidates, Addison McDowell. Big victory, Addison. They're way ahead in the polls. Brad Knott. Thank you, Brad. Pat Harrigan. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Good. Mark Harris. They like you. And the Speaker of the North Carolina House, a man who's done an incredible job. He gets it. He gets it. He really gets it. Tim Moore. Thank you, Tim. And when it came time to pick a chairman of the Republican National Committee and Convention and everything else having to do with national politics, I came to a man named Michael Watley of North Carolina. And the reason is because at 10 o'clock in the evening, when we all had those televisions on, and I saw weird things happening, drops at 3.02 in the morning and all the things that were happening, North Carolina held totally steady. He had 602 lawyers working. He held it steady. And other states, I was leading by a lot. And all of a sudden, people went to sleep. They thought that was over. And I said, no, because I know how bad these people are. But North Carolina had held steady. He was the head of your Republicans in North Carolina. did a phenomenal job. So I immediately called him. I said, let's do it. And I got him. Please stand up. 
Please stand up. You have done a fantastic job. Fantastic. And working with Laura Trump, what a team that is, right? She's doing a good job, right? And I said, don't worry about the votes. Just guard the votes, right? Just guard. We have all the votes you need. Just guard the votes. And he's doing that. And he's doing it at levels that nobody's seen before. And I hope we're going to have a big, beautiful surprise, because we're not going to let them steal this election. And they didn't do it in North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Great job. A wonderful gentleman who I met a little while ago, Michael Verardo, and he is a wounded warrior and a, just a highly respected guy. Michael, wherever you may be. Michael? Hi, Michael. Wow. You look good. I'm not messing with you, Michael. Wow. Good-looking guy. Thanks, Michael. Great, great patriot. Great person. Members of the Charlotte Police Department are here. Please stand up. You are phenomenal. What a job. What a job they do. Thank you. What a job they do. Thank you very much. And Chief of the Catawba Nation, Brian Harris. Brian, where are you, Brian? They've been so supportive. They've been so supportive. Thank you very much. From the moment we take back the White House from Kamala Harris, say yeah, they switch. It's every day. It'll, next week, they'll have somebody else when they find out how bad she is. She's worse than he is. But when we take it back from Kamala and crooked Joe Biden, the most crooked president we've ever had, I believe we are going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country. We're going to do it. We're going to do it fast. <laughs> Starting on day one, we will end inflation and make America affordable again. Inflation is killing our people. They've got inflation. I think real inflation is closer to 50 percent. They like to say 23, 24 percent. No, they don't add everything. I think, look at interest rates. They're through the roof. Nobody can buy a house. You can't get the money even if you want it. To bring down the prices of all goods, we will stop the Biden-Harris war on American energy, and we will drill, baby, drill. That includes racing car. You know, that's good. You're going to spend a lot less money for your, for your gasoline. You have that special stuff. I will terminate the Green News scam, and I will end the Biden-Harris electric vehicle mandate on day one. And we already gave you the largest tax cuts in history, but we will pass massive tax cuts for workers, and that includes, remember, no tax on tips. No tax on tips. No tax on tips. To protect North Carolina workers, I will revoke China's most favored nation status. Think of it. They're most favored because they're a developing nation. Well, we're a developing nation, too, because we've gone to hell and back. We're a developing nation, too. They are considered a developing nation, so they get advantages that we don't get. Not going to happen. And I will pass the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act. That means that if China or any other country makes us pay a 100 or 200 percent tariff or tax, we will make them pay a reciprocal tariff or tax of 100 or 200 percent immediately right back. It's basically you hurt us and we hurt you, and eye for an eye, look at it any way you want. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after we, we, the people in this room, win the presidency, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled. We're going to get it settled quickly. I'll do it as president-elect, I'll do it. And I will be doing something that nobody else even talks about. We have never been so close. I will prevent World War III. We're heading to World War III. We're heading right into the teeth of it, because we have stupid people representing us, and they're being represented against people that are at the top of their game. I will restore peace 
through strength, which is what we have. And in my next term, we will build a great Iron Dome missile defense shield over our country, a dome the likes of which nobody has ever seen before. And it will be entirely made in the USA. You know, Ronald Reagan wanted to do that, but honestly, it's a long time ago. We didn't have the technology. Now we have the greatest technology in the world. And in case there's a problem, we're going to be stopping them, but we're going to have the best in the world. It's all going to be made right here. I will not cut one penny from Social Security or Medicare, and I will not raise the retirement age. One day. I won't even raise it by one day. And, you know, they're talking about, he was talking about, she's talking about re lifting the retirement age. She's going to have to because they're putting a lot of the illegal aliens that are coming into our country. They're going into Social Security and Medicare. They're going into a hospital. We're not going to raise it one penny or one day. I kept that promise, remember, for four years. For four years, they said, oh, he's going to raise Social Security. No, for four years, I didn't, and I won't do it. I'm the one that won't do it. And remember, I said something else. I'm going to keep you out of wars. I kept you out of wars. We had no wars with Donald Trump as your president. We defeated ISIS. We beat ISIS in four weeks as opposed to five years, which is was supposed to take. Remember this. Our military is great. They're not woke. The guys on top, the political guys are woke. But they can't convince them. I saw ISIS dissolve before us once I put the military on it, once they had the commander-in-chief behind them. We have great generals, and there's not woke. They're not woke. They won't be woke. They can't be talked into being woke. They'd leave before that happens. But we have people on the top that are woke, and they're all gone. We're going to get rid of them so fast. We're going to rebuild our cities into beacons of hope, safety, and beauty better than they've ever been before. We'll have to work with Democrat governors and mayors in many cases, but we're going to rebuild our cities. They're crime-ridden, horribly run places right now. We're going to clean them up, and we're going to do something that's really good, and we're going to take our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We're going to clean it up, renovate it. We're going to rebuild our capital city so that it is no longer a nightmare of murder and crime, but rather it will become the most beautiful capital anywhere in the world. We're going to take over the management, the leadership of it. Right now, you go from North Carolina. Let's go and see the Washington Monument on the assumption that they don't change the name, which they want to. They want to change the Jefferson Memorial. Not going to happen. Remember when we were having a problem in Washington where they were trying to knock down some of our monuments, and I passed a bill? And the bill said, if you touch a monument, if we catch you even in the act, you go to jail for 10 years. And there's no 10 years equal one year. It's 10 years. You serve 10 years. And it was amazing. I looked outside the beautiful White House windows. I looked outside, and people were just leaving town. It was an incredible thing. I took, it, I took old legislation that, frankly, you could never pass, very old, 1926. And I restored it, and I said, 10 years, if you take down that, and they were all getting ready. They had ropes around the necks of these gorgeous pieces of art. I said, you do that, you go into jail for 10 years, and they left those ropes hanging. They, they couldn't get out of town fast enough. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content onto the shoulders of our children. And I will not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or a mask mandate. And I will keep men out of women's sports, and I will fully uphold our great Second Amendment. We will protect innocent life, and we will restore very quickly free speech. And I will secure our elections. Finally, we're going to get them secured. Our goal will be one day voting with paper ballots, proof of citizenship, and voter ID. But until then, Republicans must win. 
We want a landslide that's just, and it is really an expression that's used. It's very tough for them. Too big to rig. We're way ahead. We're way ahead by more than even the polls say. We have to make it so big, Richard, that they can't do it. There's not a thing they're going to be able to do about it. So too big to win. You have to get out there and vote. Get everybody. Get everybody. Get them all. Remember this. It's a strange thing. Evangelicals, Christians, they don't vote very much. We got to vote. They got to vote. They're great. They're such great people. Gun owners, the NRA, you know, gave us their total endorsement. But gun owners don't vote. They tend not to vote. We have to get them to vote. If we could get the evangelicals, Christians, if we can get gun owners to vote, it's not even an election, but they got to get out. So get your people at church to vote, okay? If you want to save America, get your friends, get your family, get everyone you know and vote. Vote early, vote absentee, vote election day. I don't care how you vote. You got to get out. You got to vote. And make sure your vote counts. Follow your vote. Check your vote. Check it. You can do it. Check your vote that they don't rob you of your vote. Such an important thing. And if you want to help ensure election integrity, sign up at protectthevote.com. Protectthevote.com. And watch those people. Make sure they don't cheat. And Michael's doing a great job. And you just watch him, Michael. From Asheville to Raleigh. And this is, I, I have to tell you, a, an incredible group of people, the spirit, the incredible spirit. We have so much to say, but in conclusion, from Asheville to Raleigh, from Greensboro to Greenville, from Wilmington to right here in Charlotte, this state was forged by some of the toughest men and some of the strongest women ever to walk the face of the earth. Our American ancestors were back country farmers and frontier settlers, woodsmen, craftsmen, workers and warriors who poured their love into this land and they loved their families and they wanted to take care of their families at all costs. They climbed the mountains, fought the battles, conquered the dangers, tamed the unknown wilderness, built the factories and gave everything they had to make America into the greatest nation in the history of the world. But now we are a nation in decline. We are a nation in decline. Can you believe it? We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, lost its willpower, and lost its strength. We are a nation that has quite simply lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. Less than four years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. We'll be a great nation again. With our leadership, every disaster Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have created can be fixed and can be fixed very quickly. Every problem can be solved and every wrong can be rectified. By this time next year, America's borders will be strong, sealed, and secure. Inflation will be in full retreat. Our economy will be roaring back. Optimism will be surging. The American dream will be thriving again for citizens of every race, religion, color, and creed. Law and justice will reign all throughout our land. Freedom will be restored. The flame of liberty will be burning bright. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the worst administration in the history of our country, will be a fading memory of the past. And our great silent majority, including the once forgotten men and women of our country, will be the one shaping America's magnificent future when I am the 47th President of the United States. Because we are all Americans, and together we will show November 5th to be the most important day in the history of our country. There will never have been a more important day because if we don't do the right thing and if it doesn't work out, it's got to work out. If it doesn't work out, we won't have a country. We're going to have a great country again. We're going to have a great country again. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God.
And together we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. We will make America free again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you, North Carolina. Thank you very much.